Welcome back to Political Science. In this unit, we're going to be exploring all about the topic of interest groups. Now, throughout the entire semester, we have been exploring this relationship between the government on the one hand and we the people on the other hand. We, after all, live in a democracy, and it's important that we the people have a say in what happens in government. Of course, one of the ways that we do that is through voting. But that's not the only way that we can get involved in terms of making a difference. In fact, many Americans throughout the country will join together with one another. They'll practice their First Amendment right to assembly, to come together with like-minded people, and to petition their government for change. So that's what we're going to be exploring this, this week in this unit, is how individuals can come together to form groups to try to make an impact and change government policy. So throughout this unit, we're really going to be exploring how these groups form, how they come together, what strategies they use, and what is their impact going to look like in American democracy. And so to get us started, we're going to, as we often do, look at definitions and kind of lay the groundwork for a high level picture of what these groups are and what they do. So in this video, our focus is going to be on number one, defining interest groups, and we're going to pay special attention to how they're similar and how they're different from political parties because we've explored that concept as well. They have some key similarities, but they also have some important differences. We'll also be looking at some categories of interest groups. There are a number of ways to categorize them, but we're going to look at three big categories and they're, they're a little bit different from one another. And finally, we'll look at some of the strategies that uh, these interest groups use, including employing lobbyists and spending money. So we're going to see what do some of those strategies look like. So to kick things off, let's go back in time to the 1700s at a time when debate was happening over what our form of government should look like. And you're going to remember that back then there were the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And of course, one of the most prominent Federalists was James Madison. In fact, he was one of the three authors that wrote the Federalist Papers, who were really advocating for the United States to adopt the new constitution. So Federalist number 10 is one of James Madison's most famous essays. And in it, he's talking about the problem of factions or groups that arise. Now we live in a democracy and in a democracy, you could have a small group or maybe even a very large group rise up and cause a lot of problems. Let's say there's a group that rises up and they wanna take everybody's rights away or maybe just an unpopular minority group, maybe strip them of their rights. Well, that was a concern to Madison, and he wanted to understand ways that you could stop that. And so in his essay, he's describing there's a couple ways you could do it. Number one, just get rid of the differences that we have differences of agreement anyway. And that's actually not very practical because you'd have to strip everybody of their freedom to disagree with one another. And you'd have to make everybody pretty much identical and exactly the same when it comes to things like their wealth or their habits or what have you. There's all kinds of ways that make us different from one another. So if you get rid of all of those things and make everybody exactly the same, you do not live in a free country anymore. And so he started to look at other ways that you could deal with that. Now, one way is structuring the government in such a way that, you know, one small group can't come and tyrannize everybody else. So they really made sure to make those changes part of the constitution. But another thing that could happen is you could allow for a competition. So let's say that that group rises up. Well, there's going to be other groups that counter. And so one of the solutions to having factions or having these different groups is to allow them to compete with one another, compete for voters, compete in the marketplace of ideas. Having all of these groups battling it out gives people choices. And it's one of the reasons why he advocated for a large republic. More people means more differences, more groups arising, and more competition, which ultimately he saw as a good thing. And this is really related to this political theory uh, that's called pluralism or pluralist theory. And it's the idea that you have in a democracy power sharing. All of these groups come together. They have different levels of power, but they're all sort of hashing it out. And that competition from different groups in society uh, that open system can really allow different entry points. Nobody has all of the power. You have all of these groups that are trying to influence government. And so that competition helps to spread the power out throughout society. We'll talk a little bit more about pluralism later in this unit, as well as some challenges or some critiques to that view. So now let's go into describing interest groups. We already talked a little bit about factions and the fact that people join groups together. When we're talking about interest groups, we mean that there's an organized group of individuals 
or maybe even businesses or organizations that come together. And their goal is they're trying to influence government decision making or policy, government policy, on the basis of some sort of similarity or shared interests that they have together. Now, interest groups are going to be inevitable in any democracy. We have the right to come together, to petition our government for change, to, to speak freely, to assemble with other people. And so, um, you know, we're always going to form groups of like-minded individuals. Sometimes interest groups get a bad rap. You may have heard somebody talking about special interests, having too much power or too much control over government. And so anytime you hear words like interests or special interests, we're talking about the same thing. So let me give you a few examples. You can sometimes have groups of people who come together because they want to see changes in government policy. So for instance, the National Association for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, or NORML, they're people who come together because they want to see marijuana legalized at the state and federal level. Uh, similar to Gun Owners of America, they're a group of gun owners who come together to advocate for Second Amendment rights and the right to own firearms, um, and making sure that the government is maybe not infringing on those rights. You've got groups like the National Association of Police Organizations. Now, this is going to be uh, professional groups, maybe uh, police officers throughout the country and groups that re represent police officers to come together to lobby the government for certain benefits for that kind of occupation. And in fact, we see many interest groups that are aligned with specific occupations, doctors and nurses and school teachers and so on. There's many of them. Uh, finally, you'll see some groups that actually are really focused on getting candidates elected. So one example is Emily's List. Now, Emily's List is an interest group that comes together to raise money and to donate it to uh, Democratic pro-choice women candidates. So uh, if somebody's a Democrat, they're female, and they have pro-choice views on abortion, uh, this is a group that's trying to get them elected by giving them money and trying to help with their elections, especially in close races. So these are some examples of these groups that come together to seek to influence the government. You might already be thinking, okay, we've got a group that's coming together and they're trying to make changes in the government. Well, that sounds like a political party that we talked about earlier. And so why don't we take the apples to apples comparison first? We're going to look at how interest groups and political parties are similar. Political parties have to compete with one another. They're not guaranteed that they're going to win the election. So the Republicans and the Democrats and the Green Party and the Libertarian, they're all going to be fighting it out to see who can win that congressional seat or that governor seat. Um, so there is a, a degree of competition that exists in the war of ideas, in raising money and fundraising and mobilizing Americans to vote or to do what they want. And so we're going to see that that's a real similarity with interest groups. Uh, for interest groups, there are a number of them, and they're all competing in the war of ideas. They're all trying to raise money and to be the most effective. So they do have that similarity in that they have to compete with one another. When political parties are elected to office, one of the first things they try to do is to change the laws or the policies to be more favorable to their views. And in a similar way, interest groups often have a focus on changing a government policy or making the laws a little bit better for their perceived set of issues or a problem that they're concerned about. So they will actually try to get, to get those laws changed. And one of the ways that they do that is they try to use their influence over lawmakers and other government officials, talking to them directly, lobbying, advocating for a change. And we often see a similar dynamic when national political parties say put pressure on their members to pass a certain policy or to have a certain set of um, objectives that they're trying to accomplish. And these are all ways that interest groups and political parties are similar to one another. Now, we've taken the apples to apples comparison, so why don't we now do the apples to oranges comparison? What are the differences that exist out there? Well, there are some really key and really important differences. First and foremost, political parties tend to be pretty large, especially when you're looking at the uh, Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Uh, they have huge coalitions of people. Interest groups tend to be much smaller than political parties. So that's one difference right off the bat. They tend to have smaller membership. And importantly, they do not have the goal of getting elected into office. So uh, getting elected, operating the government, usually is not an interest group's primary goal. They may want to influence what the law is, but they're not the ones who actually want to do the lawmaking themselves. With political parties, you know, because they have such broad coalitions, there's usually a lot of 
things that they're interested in. You know, you might have a political party and they have an opinion on energy policy and immigration and guns and abortion and healthcare and you name it, right? The whole list of issues. Um, they'll actually have all of those as things that they have an opinion on or want to get accomplished. When it comes to interest groups, they tend to be much more narrowly focused. So they might have one specific issue and really have a laser focus on only that one issue. So for instance, there are interest groups that are pro-life and there are interest groups that are pro-choice. So they have a very specific view on abortion and they're gonna be advocating for their view, but they're not going to be out there making recommendations about immigration or on guns, right? These are going to be kind of issues that they leave to the side. So that's gonna be a really key difference between an interest group and a political party. And finally, there are many interest groups that are not only narrowly focused on their issues, but they're also narrowly focused on who should be a member and who should join. So for instance, if you wanna join the American Academy of Pediatrics, well, you're gonna be a pediatrician. And it might not even be open to other kinds of doctors like cardiologists and oncologists. Uh, it's really gonna be for a very narrow subset of Americans. And there are going to be other interest groups that represent the interests of school teachers and uh, you know realtors and all kinds of other jobs. And so there are going to be some specific characteristics that members might share in common. Uh, other interest groups might tailor to specific religious groups. You know, maybe um, you have an interest group that focuses specifically on one religious community uh, and it kind of excludes other people. So that's pretty different from a political party because typically political parties want as many people to join as possible. The more members you have, uh, the more likely you are to win that election and get the majority of the votes uh, or at least more than anybody else. So that gives us an idea of what interest groups are. Now let's take a look at some of the categories of interest groups. And the first one that we're going to explore is something called a member organization. A member organization is a special kind of an interest group where individuals typically join freely and usually they're paying some kind of a yearly due or a fee to join that group. People usually join membership organizations because they have some sort of a common interest in a set of issues, or they have some concerns, or maybe they just wanna spend time with other people who share their views. So one example of this would be the National Rifle Association. The NRA, uh, as many of you know, is a gun rights advocacy group uh, that was founded a long time ago, back in the 1800s. And they have roughly 5 million members in the United States, uh, most, and well, I guess all of whom, support laws protecting gun rights and Second Amendment. If you want to join the NRA, it's not like registering for a political party, which is free. Yeah, if you want to join the NRA, you have to pay a fee of about $45 per year. And there are going to be some benefits that come along with that. Number one, uh, they'll give you a magazine. We're going to talk a little bit later about why interest groups might want to give some material incentives. Uh, but, you know, you get some benefits of membership and the money is often used uh, to lobby members of Congress and other lawmakers uh, to support that set of interests. So uh, membership organizations are going to be ones that just typical average everyday Americans are able to join. Usually there is some kind of a fee attached. It's not just everyday Americans who join interest groups. And in fact, there are a lot of interest groups that represent a specific company, corporation, or a government entity. And so these groups don't serve individual members. Instead, we're gonna see them as offshoots of a different corporation or a government entity. They're gonna represent these entities before the state and US governments to try to advocate for the position of that entity. A lot of you watching this will probably have a Facebook account or an Instagram account. And you'll probably know that the parent company of both of those is Meta. Meta spends a lot of money lobbying government. And so in 2022 alone, they spent over $15 million just trying to get their message out there in front of lawmakers and to advocate for the views of their company. And so they were out there trying to influence policy on all kinds of different issues uh, regarding technology and social media. So any kind of laws that were coming up, uh, including laws about moderating content or kind of the rules regarding what social media companies are and are not allowed to do, they really do heavily focus on that. Other large tech companies also spend a lot of money in lobbying the government. Companies like Amazon and Google or Alphabet uh, spend enormous amounts of money, just like Facebook does, to try to get their message across to government. 
to do this and to represent their interests, these groups will usually hire somebody called a lobbyist, and we'll explore what that is in a little bit. But they'll usually have somebody who either works for the company, we call those an in-house lobbyist, or they'll pay somebody external uh, and contract with them to do the lobbying on their behalf. We call those contract lobbyists. So as an example, I've been to a lot of meetings in our school district, LACCD, and at many of those meetings, we'll have an individual come in and give a legislative update. This guy's name is Dale Shimasaki, and he is a lobbyist and CEO of a group called Strategic Education Services. And so he'll come into one of the chancellor's meetings and describe what's going on in Sacramento and some of the laws that might benefit LACCD as a whole and maybe LACCD students in particular. Now his job, he's contracted to work on behalf of LACCD to tell lawmakers in Sacramento what would benefit our district and to really make the case for why they should consider certain policies. So that's his full-time job. He gets paid for that. Um, some groups, government entities especially, might also hire somebody called a legislative liaison. And so this is going to be somebody who works for that government entity, and they're really going to interface with state and federal lawmakers in a similar way. They're trying to get certain legislation passed and to advocate for the views of their organization. So for example, here you can see a job announcement from LA Community College District, and it's for a legislative and government relations officer. So this would be a full-time employee working for our school district who would try to lobby uh, and represent the district to the government. And so you can see that this actually pays pretty well in the range of about $140,000 to $170,000 per year. So it goes without saying, if that looks appealing to you, maybe you should consider a career in political science. You never know. You might end up as a legislative relations officer. All right, so moving on, uh, we looked at our first two categories. We're going to now look at our third category, and those are going to be associations. Now, remember, first we had individuals coming together. Then we had these entities like uh, one company or one government agency that was representing itself to government. Here, we're going to have a collection of companies or a collection of agencies come together. Now, typically, these are always going to be in the same industry or trade. And one of the best examples of an association is something called a trade association. So let's say you're walking through the mall and you want to buy some clothes. And as you're walking through, you see stores like American Eagle Outfitters, Abercrombie & Fitch. You got a Banana Republic, a Calvin Klein. The Gap is over here. You got the Levi store. Um, all of these stores are competing with one another for your business. So they are competitors at the end of the day. But by coming together in a trade association, they can collectively use their power to lobby the federal government for benefits that are going to protect the entire industry. So, in fact, that's what we see. We've got um, over a thousand American clothing brands that have come together in this group called the American Apparel and Footwear Association, not to be confused with American Apparel, the brand. And so this group will come together to lobby the government and to get it to pass favorable legislation for this industry. Things like making sure that counterfeiters aren't out there making a fake pair of Levi jeans, uh, making sure that the policies when it comes to sourcing materials and supply chains are favorable for this industry. Now, at the end of the day, they are all competitors and they're all competing for your business. But if they can work together to get some favorable policies for the entire industry, it may help all of them uh, in order to do that. And they might have better profits and, you know, maybe more efficiency as a result of that. Now that we've explored these different categories, let's round out the last few slides by looking at some of the strategies that these interest groups will use to influence government. One really big thing that interest groups do is monitoring government activity, particularly when it comes to new bills and pieces of legislation that have been introduced. If, say, Congress or a state legislature is considering a law that might help or hurt this interest group's interests, they will definitely keep uh, track of that, pay attention to it, and try to put pressure on lawmakers to make a favorable decision for them. They also spend a lot of time and effort trying to educate lawmakers and the public on their view. Let's say you're a member of Congress. It is impossible for you to know everything about every organization and how each law is going to impact everybody. So politicians are not experts on every subject, and they're going to rely on interest groups for information, especially when it comes to highly technical topics. So one interesting example of this is a group called the Texas Blockchain Council. And they're going to spend a lot of time and effort educating 
uh, especially the Texas state government, all about Bitcoin mining and crypto mining. This is a topic that is pretty technical and pretty difficult for uh, somebody who hasn't studied it much to really understand what that process is all about, how it impacts energy systems and so forth. So a big focus for this group is educating the public and especially educating lawmakers on how different policies could either help or hurt those industries within their state. Finally, we're going to see, and we'll spend more time exploring this later in a later lecture, but it also provides an important method for you and me as Americans, as people who are interested in the lives of our community to engage in political participation. It's not just about voting when it comes to making change. We can uh, organize rallies. We can educate other people. We can get out the vote. There's all kinds of ways that we can organize for change. A very important strategy that these interest groups will often use is something called lobbying. So as long as we've had government, we've always had people who want to influence the decisions of government. And rumor has it, the way that the legend goes, uh, the way that we got this term lobbyist was back in the day, there would be a lot of people who would stand around the hotel lobby and hope to see a president or a member of Congress, somebody with influence, and try to chat with them. If you ever walked into a really nice hotel, on the lobby level, you'll typically find a bar, people sitting around having drinks, uh, maybe smoking some cigars. Uh, and so this term lobbyist supposedly came from people who would sit in the lobby and wait until they saw somebody with influence to try to convince them of their view. So they'd be people who work for big corporations, uh, maybe people who have a special interest in mind to try to catch the ear and the influence of that person. When we talk about lobbyists today, typically we talk about somebody who does that for their full-time job. So they're typically getting paid uh, by an organization or by a corporation, and their primary goal is to influence government policy, to change the laws in some favorable way. Now, today, lobbyists have to register with the federal government. In fact, if you spend more than 20% of your time in your job um, advocating uh, for changes to the government, you actually have to register with the government as a lobbyist to keep track of who is actually trying to influence government. We're going to continue to look at lobbyists in a future video, but for now, why don't we go ahead and round out this video by exploring these final two concepts. And these are really strategies that interest groups can use to try to affect change. Number one, we're gonna call that inside lobbying. When you're engaging in inside lobbying, you're really taking the message of the interest group directly to the government. And that's going to include people like lawmakers and people in positions of influence within government. So there's a number of ways that you can engage in inside lobbying. You can testify in a committee hearing. Uh, you can meet face to face with a lawmaker in their office and make your case to them. You could even draft bills and have your organization write some suggested policy or suggested language for a law. And so this actually does happen quite frequently. Now, you'll still need a member of Congress to introduce that legislation, but guess what? You can give them all of the ideas they need to do it. So that's inside lobbying. You're focusing your effort on people inside of government. Outside lobbying is going to be focusing that attention on people outside of government. That's going to be getting your uh, message out to the general public. You might do things like write a press release or prepare a story to go into the media. You might join in coalitions with other groups to really try to spread the word about your particular subject. And some of you might have seen this before. If you're maybe on a mailing list for some group, they might send you um, some information and say, hey, this is a, a really important issue. Can you please contact your member of Congress? Can you contact this person in government? Tell them that you want them to vote this way on such and such bill. So that's asking members to actually do the lobbying as well, have them contact the government and put pressure to vote a certain way. So we've covered a lot of ground in this video. We've explored what an interest group is. We've looked at these three various categories and we've talked about some of the strategies that they use to get their way. So I really want you to be familiar with all of those things. As we go on in the future videos, we're going to go deeper into this topic of interest groups and how they attempt to get what they want. I'll see you at the next one.